This is day one <coughs> of the November 04 seven day retreat in spring water. A beautiful, sunny, windy, cool, bright, cloudy, <laughs> everything fall day. <laughs> What a joy to be here together, to be able to do that, to come together in this war and conflict torn world and sit together quietly, not to strengthen our beliefs and faiths and whatever all may be important to us mentally spiritually, but to find out what is, not to confirm or assert, but to wonder. In openness, which is not easy because we are just totally wired up with ideas. Beliefs that we are so close to, that have been so long ago instilled in us, that we're not aware of it. We're not aware of all of our beliefs and assumptions about ourselves and each other and the world and God and faith and religion. So the, the first question is, can the mind empty itself of all of that so that truth or reality, what is, can be perceived, can be here undistortedly. That's a tall order. We've just come through an incredible um, political turmoil campaign in which it seemed the one who can lie best influence uh, the public best, advertise best, have the most convincing ads. It, it really made your heart palpitate what's coming next. The one who did best at this comes out the winner. Isn't that so? Wonder about it. And wonder also whether we can be free of that, trying to convince each other through advertising ourselves. Which means we start from the truth that we do not know what we are. We don't build up or cling to past built up images about ourselves, which means becoming aware that we live in an image world. Past images and building up new ones, for what? For what reason? And of course, what was said so frequently in this campaign was security. We need security. And we have come to believe that an image world, a movie, a, a video of the world and ourselves can provide security. And we ourselves have to come upon the fact that it does not, that we live a very insecure life trusting in the images that this brain and the brain of all of the, our ancestors and contemporaries are constantly refurbishing, reinforcing, adding new nuances to this world of imagery about what I am and what you are and what we ought to be or would like to be and what the others are. It's horrendous. 
how we live in this sort of a magic world of falsehood. And the the possibility of sitting down together, all of us from many different backgrounds, not the whole sample here uh, of, of possible backgrounds, but quite a bit of different upbringings and cultural uh, niveaus and cultural contexts has come together here. And here we are sitting quietly down and realize how difficult or almost impossible it seems to be to be open and empty. Not know, not cling, which means becoming aware of how we cling to what we know and want that confirmed by Tony or by the, the radio or the newspaper, the elections. So to, to start out with what I'll hesitatingly call the courage, because this is also a false concept, but with the willingness or the, the interest of not clinging to something but becoming aware of what it is that we cling to, this whole scaffold of beliefs, what it is that makes us secure and happy, what it is that is necessary for our children. To, to start with not knowing and seeing what it is we cling to. And whatever we cling to or this mind clings to throws a deep shadow shadow of darkness over that which is here, right now, right in front of us, under our noses and eyes. We don't see it. We can't aware it as long as there is this clinging to our presuppositions and assumptions about being this or that. I want you put that in yourselves like these school papers, worksheets, you, there are all these blanks and you fill it in yourself. What it is you most dearly believe in and most anxiously defend and question it. Not say, I got to throw this out, I got to make a supreme sacrifice. That's not it. It is a, a matter of becoming aware, seeing, realizing, Realizing meaning making real that which is just idea, assumption. That I am, that, that I am this, I am a child of God, or I am a, a free human being. I am the most free human being. We've heard that so much to ad nauseum, that we are the freest country. D doesn't this just make your goose pimples rise? Or everybody blessing America. <laughs> what is America? N not one ever, ever said, bless this whole world. And we, the stronger and louder we protest that we're Americans and will defend it, the more we protest our total ignorance of that which is true of all of us, namely being each other, being one whole, us without them, or them without us, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a wonderfully worthy thing, isn't it, to sit down and not know, and really interested in finding out from moment to moment not supreme religious truths but hearing the howling of the wind or the calling of the crows the silence in between sounds the beating heart can you hear it you hear the the heartbeat 
A lot of people don't hear it. Sometimes when I've told a doctor that my heart does sometimes funny things, he says, well, how do you know? <laughs> There's nothing to know, you hear it. But apparently, it is not with all of our upbringing of knowing, we have gotten alienated or removed from directly experiencing. The, the doors have closed, are shuttered. Sometimes in talking with people who come here as a guest, and it's always wonderful to have guests in our dialogue groups, but you realize that it is not an easy or common thing to be able to watch one's thoughts, to be aware of thinking, and to look at the content of the thoughts. That is not easy. It's not a, maybe it's a given in the beginning, but it is sort of land or mudslided over through all that we have accumulated, what we know and therefore live in this thinking, knowing, instead of experiencing the heartbeat. And then maybe for a moment, the heartbeat is experienced. And it's a, a wonderful, lovely moment. And then immediately we want to know, people come and say, what has happened to me? Tell me. This and this was observed. What is going on? And want to translate this into knowing, which is not wrong, but to become aware that that's a different level of living than to live in the listening and attending and observing without knowing. Never mind that the brain is so programmed to want to create the volumes of knowledge. <coughs> Let it do it, but be aware that the volumes of knowledge are not the immediacy of experience that gave rise to this knowledge. Knowledge always comes from direct, direct experience, unless it is knowledge about knowledge, then it is, has lost its contact with the real. If what I'm saying right now sounds too abstract or is sort of not accessible, then please either wrestle with it and also bring it to a group. And I'm not, not here to sound lofty. On the contrary, it's, it's my duty, my task to bring the lofty, the abstract down to the real where we can all participate in looking and listening with new eyes and ears. Listening and looking without knowing this instant of this subtle wind. You've all probably heard the, the question that was asked among a bunch of monks who were dialoguing with each other. Is it the wind that's moving the flag or is it the flag that's moving the wind? Something like that. You can go on ad infinitum. And somebody passing by who had some understanding says, it's your mind's venerable sirs that is moving. <laughs> isn't that wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> Letting go of this lust for dialogue and for winning and realizing it's the mind that's moving in many ways. Not just trying to figure out, is it the wind or is it the flag? But what's going on up here? And to become aware of this movement, which is multifaceted. Not just the objective question, but also, I need to know. Because I need to be a knower among these people. So that they will respect me. 
like me or admire me, make me their chief monk. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to watch these subtle movements, which the more the mind becomes transparent to itself, is all right, every once in a while I hit this, is this okay? I can't help it here. Um, the more the mind becomes transparent to itself, the more you discover. You discover, like this morning, all kind of motivations with everything you do for me and many of us. It is, how will, the, how will this look to others? Will people misunderstand it? Make a false picture of me, which, which is not how I am. It's just constantly going like little flotsam through the mind when it's not in this attentive, meditative state. And not, woe me, I'm doing this, but how marvelous that it becomes visible. Do you see the difference? Usually when we become aware of some inconsequential thinking or maybe evil thinking, mean thinking, we, we try to hide it and, or not acknowledge it or else delight in saying, woe me, the sinner. <laughs> but the beauty of the possibility of seeing and hearing what goes on inside, which is what goes on in all human beings, which is not to be condemned, but to be realized, seen, experienced, without either condemnation or approval because it steers us onto a, a new different track the moment we condemn or, or the, I say we it is really all going on in this brain in an amazingly autonomous way there's no little man or woman in there who does that it's what we used to think and not used to many people even though they may not put it in this particular way, are so deeply convinced that there is a me. We just haven't found it yet. In some ways, the brain researchers are far ahead of a lot of us, that they admit and realize that there is no such thing. It's just a very complex, moving, functioning brain, which operates as a whole, not individual control stations. So, to get together here, lots of different, what we call individuals, to sit down quietly, And then what? Often the question comes, what am I supposed to do? I came to Spring Water. I've left the other place where I'm practicing. I'm not there right now. So what am I supposed to do here in Spring Water? I want to oblige. Or I want to conform. I wanted to do what people do here. So what do you do? What do we do? Find the door. Is there a door? It's a wonderful question. And it's nice if you come upon your own question, which really grabs you, engages you. There's this rustling of the branches, the woodwork at times, people moving and the sound of cloth on cloth, the wind in the trees. Who's doing that listening? Now, the brain will oblige at any time and say, well, I'm doing it, but don't go so fast with what this brain has learned to supply. What is this I that is doing it? You could say, well, it's me, Tony. It's not you. 
It's not your listening. It's my listening. Well, what is my list? What is my? Who is the owner of the listening? Is there a listening and an owner of it? And then if you get really deep into the wool with this trying to figure things out intellectually, you may get very confused or dis dismayed at the confusion, then you're free at any time or at any time there's the freedom to stop and listen this moment to the sounds of this moment. And not know who is hearing. Just listen. It's there. Whether you decide it's me or it's God or it's I don't know what, the sound is here, isn't it? Or you could say, oh, there was no sound here. I didn't even hear the trees until you mentioned them. It's interesting because there was so much involvement in thoughts and internal dialogue that the trees were not heard. But somebody draws attention to it, and there they are, the sound. And then the question, well, who is hearing it? And again, engagement intellectually, trying to figure it out. Or becoming a bit wiser and say, I don't know, let's just listen. Maybe in this quiet listening, something will reveal itself. There, listen. Is it here, is it there, or is it everywhere? The, the more immediate the, the listening, which means removed from thinking, the less you know where it is coming from, because that's a function of the thinking brain, north, east, south, west. But is it there or is it here? When the brain is quietly listening as a whole, the direction is not as important, is not as dominant as the sounding. And then the brain will say, oh, I'm getting old, I'm losing this or that capacity. People get very concerned about losing memory as they're getting older. And it could be a dementia of a sort, but it is also, it goes along with the work of this moment, I must say. <laughs> the more you are in the present moment, attending, awareing, the less important it is what you remember. It doesn't get registered so deeply or importantly, so you forget it again. So it is not just a sign of aging, although it is partly, but it is also an indication that you live more in the present and less in recording and bookkeeping. Who did what to me? And the brain from old conditioning recording is for possible revenge. I'm going to do to him what they did to me. We don't quite spell it out this way, but the brain does that. It's amazing how unfortunate we are conditioned to remember what was done to us and avenge it. I'm going to see a lot of avenging going on in our political world, which means the mess continues. <laughs> Whereas, if you're very much here, it doesn't matter who did what to whom. What matters is to be here right now and listening to the wind and the heartbeat breathing. 
without keeping score. I just, as I said, without keeping score, what popped into the mind was yesterday, for the first time in a year or so, Tiger Woods played well. <laughs> He was first, and I was happy. I was very happy over this. And he <laughs> smiled all over. He hasn't smiled in the whole year. <laughs> and now it just went all over the universe, this smile. <laughs> he doesn't have to worry about privatizing his wedding. That's all over. They're married now. They've had their honeymoon on a big, huge private yacht away from the paparazzis. And they had a beautiful swing. Did you watch it? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> and amazing to watch how this human being here, who is very much in tune with conditioning that goes on for everyone, wants to see this guy win. Today, this is probably already going on. I could watch it on the computer. It's a supreme sacrifice. <laughs> well, maybe it's good not to watch. You may be going down. So that, that year was a year of learning to live with that grief of seeing Tiger not make it. And somebody else take his spot. Now he's number four. Isn't he? Four on, on the money earning list. Somebody here who, who watches that with me. Hmm? So, there is, when, see, and this is such a nice demonstration. We do live, you can call it with disdain, living dualistically. I don't care what you call it, but we do live on different levels. And if you enter into that, uh, uh, sports uh, level there where there have to be winners. Of course, you could say and watch yourself whether you're really honest. You could say, oh, I just watch the beauty of the rhythmic swing. I don't care. <laughs> That's not true. You also want the guy to win. At least I do. <laughs> and to, to be honest with oneself and not serve imagery. Mm -hmm. And also realize that Right now, this moment, I don't really care whether he wins or not, because this is, we are now meeting and living on a different level of being, which takes all the energy gathering in this moment of listening. I could relate it. I could narrate the story of yesterday, of watching. But it doesn't affect this body-mind. Um, I don't care that I'm not watching. It's not a supreme sacrifice. There's nothing like being here and sharing with like-minded or like-no-minded friends. <laughs> We will end here for today.